Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. We are in space and time here in the sanctuary reservoir church and also greeting you online. It's good to be with you. I'm going to walk us through some announcements this morning. If we haven't met, I'm Ivy. I'm a pastor here. And I'm going to get us going this morning, giving you a taste of the flow of the service to come, a little bit about Reservoir and some announcements. So we'll have these welcome and announcements and then a song, a spiritual practice, sermon, some ways to collectively hold our prayers with one another called the prayers of the people, another song, and then addiction. But I want to welcome you this morning. Uh, Reservoir, as always, welcomes you just as you are, without exception. And we hope that you discover the love of Jesus, the gift of community, and the joy of living from wherever you are at, whether you are in the living room right now, moving around, or on a walk, or having a sip of coffee. We welcome you with the attention that you can offer this morning and know that you are held in the community of other people this morning as well. I'll get us going with some announcements coming up today and this week, if you're interested. The first of which is this Unpacking Christianity class. Um, we have a little bit of a history of using this word unpack as a way to offer different experiences for folks. Sometimes we have in the fall an unpack your church hurts and wounds class. And last year, Steve, our senior pastor, started an unpacking Christianity class. So this is starting out actually tonight. It's based on a book by David Gushy called After Evangelicalism and a Path to New Christianity. So it's sort of exploring some of the challenges of the past evangelical Christianity, but also has a rush of ideas about how to move forward, to keep moving forward with Christian faith. Um, so it starts tonight at seven o'clock, going till 8.30. It will run for five Sundays. If you're interested, reach out to Steve at steve at reservoirchurch.org, and he'll send you the link and any other information to be able to log on tonight if you're interested. Um, also this week, Thursday and Friday, there is a virtual experience that you are invited into if you're interested around sexuality. It's a conversation to re-examine and reimagine scriptural teachings on sexuality and sexual ethic, ethics in a way that actually goes beyond the conversation that has been more prevalent historically, which is around the purity culture teachings. So um, seems to be like it could be a really interesting, lively, uh, interesting time. So if you're interested, you can register at the link going up in the chat and you can use the discount code the friend discount uh, for early bird rate. All of that information going in the chat. And then if you would like to mark your calendars, maybe you find yourself dipping into online service some weeks, but also in person some weeks, or you would be up for something outside in person on Sunday, October 24th. Um, right after in-person service, so around 11-ish, um, some younger folks are going to gather together uh, to go for a hike in the Fells, which is local to here. Um, you can meet, meet uh, Meredith Outerson and some friends of hers in the parking lot. They'll likely have a big sign, um, figure out rides from there, bring a snack, water, etc. cetera. Um, but it'll be a way to gather and a way to meet some folks if you haven't or if you've been longing for that. Um, her email, Meredith's email is going in the chat as well now. And then lastly, if you're new or still feeling new and you'd love to hear a little bit more about Reservoir, what we do and why we do it the ways we do, um, or just meet some folks or have any other questions, could you fill out this form there's a form going in the chat. It's just a way for us to really know <laughs> if you're new or not. Um, and uh, there's some ways in there within the form that you can sort of delineate what you might be interested in hearing more about. One primary way is to get connected through community groups. Um, so you could also just email me directly if you wanted to ivy at reservoirchurch.org. We've got 30 or so going, always open, always um, happy to have you join. So. Let us know what would serve you best. And let me pray for us before I invite 
uh, is us into a song in time of worship. So God, thank you for this crisp autumn morning. One that ushers in a, a sense of aliveness, new breath, a new season. And God, also help us to remember your steadfastness, your loyalty that is so always with us. God, the ways that we need you this morning, could you help us find the words for that or the sense of that? And let us know that you are good and ever loving in all the ways that we need it. In your name, amen. I'll pass it over to Matt and Lindsay now for a song. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you online today. I'm Matt, as Ivy said, this is Lindsay. We, are, we can't see if we're on camera or not, so I hope we're both on camera. We're gonna sing a song together. Um, oh, there, we are. there we are, we're here, we're here. <laughs> um, we're gonna sing a song. I invite you to sing along with us. The lyrics will be on your screen. Experience the 
Amen. Thanks for singing along, friends. Hi again, folks. I'm going to move us into a time of spiritual practice. It's when we take each service that we're in in hopes that you will find the way of that practice into the fullness of your week. This fall, we are in a series called The Table, How Jesus Gathers, and it's a way for us really to explore the stories of Jesus around tables, highlighting not only Jesus's eating ministry, but also inspecting what occurred at those tables. Who was invited? Whose tables did Jesus visit? What was the shape of those tables? What were the tables set with? What was Jesus flipping or reordering of the society and culture? And what nourishment and healing was found at the center of those tables? And all of those questions, I think Jesus is actually inviting us to live them out still today. And of course, consider how we continue to gather in the way that he offers us to create and grow beloved community. We felt like this was a a rich and poignant conversation. So many of us are having it in our own spaces. How do we gather right now? What does that look like? And so we'll be pressing into that over the next few weeks of this fall. And each Sunday in this series, we'll engage with a spiritual practice called Visio Divina, which means divine seeing. It's a way in which we prayerfully invite God to speak to us, to stir our hearts as we look at an image, And as the weeks go on, you'll see that the image itself may be ordinary, nondescript or abstract even, but it's an invitation to slow down, to focus and stay with an image, stay with God in that image as you search your own heart and mind and body. The image will represent a table, some physical, some metaphorical, since I think Jesus is inviting us to consider both. And today's image will come on your screen in just a moment. Again, utilize it as a way to engage, encounter God, but also use it as a gateway to notice and be aware of God's presence in all of your settings, in conversations, in your home, on the sidewalk, on the tee. It's a way to unlock and unfold a deeper knowing of God in all of your settings. So now just take a moment to be with God, prayerful posture. You can relax, let whatever you're sitting on sort of hold the weight of you, take some deep breaths and you'll see an image come up on the screen. So take in that image for a moment. In just a few minutes, you'll hear Pastor Lydia share the story of a Canaanite woman coming to Jesus, desperately asking for help. 
And what ensues is a curious response of Jesus's, maybe even troubling to some, and a conversation around crumbs and a table. So today I invite you to look at this image of crumbs, maybe on a table or under a table, and just hold it in your mind for a few minutes. You can gaze at it, but you can also sort of take a break from that and close your eyes if you need to. Just let the image sink into your heart. As you do, just notice what stirs in you, what feelings, what emotions are rising. I'll offer a couple of prompts. Take you deeper into this image if you want. Maybe bring to mind a time, a memory, or maybe even a present situation where you've asked for help at the table. As you can, fill out the picture of that who was at the table and what was the response? Was your request, request handled and regarded with care? Were you looked in the eye? Or was it sort of crumbled and tossed to the side? as debris or crumbs? Where did your ask for help land? Take a couple more moments for those prompts. You may find yourself revisiting the picture of this image in your mind's eye as the week goes on or this memory. As you do, don't try to overanalyze or judge it. Just be with it. Just notice what comes up for you and ask Jesus to be with you in it. Let me pray for us. God who invites us to take a seat close to you. May you be with us in all of our memories and in all of our present day situations where we sit at tables and we vulnerably ask for help or put feelings out there or maybe in ways that we wish we could but hesitate. God, could you hold us? Could you be close to us in the processes that are finished and unfinished as we come to tables? In your name, amen. I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Lydia now for the sermon. Good morning, everyone. Um... It's great to be with you all. I'm gonna lower it a little bit because I'm shorter. I will read the text for us and pray for us um, and share a message with y'all today. The text comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Let me pray for us. Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time and invitation that you call us into, that you pull up a chair to the table and say to us, have a seat. We thank you that it is your love that invites us into this place. Help us to open ourselves up to see, hear, and experience you, that abundant love in all its fullness, somehow, some way in this worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After my family moved to the United States, my mom started writing letters to my grandmother. My mom was the sixth child out of eight children and she often shuffled in the loss and she would say um, didn't get much love. She, um, she started writing these letters to her mom to try to heal her relationship with my grandmother. And she wrote like five to 10 pages of affirmation and encouragement and forgiveness to try to mend the relationship. After my grandmother passed away in 2016, my uncle collected her things, one of which was a collection of all of my mother's letters to her. He sent it back to my mom. And if I wanted to get a closer understanding of their relationship, my mother, even after maybe she passes, uh, these letters would be my primary ways to do that. So reading the Bible is a little bit like this. Why do we take so much care to take the story of Jesus from the Bible to read and meditate and reflect on and attempt to even find our own stories in it? Because when I get my hands on these letters that my mom wrote, I will hurl myself over them with a Kleenex inbox, uh, peering into the mind of my mom holding her mom to see if I could find myself in the story. The story that we just read today where do you see yourself in the story? Do you find yourself relating to the disciples who are close to Jesus, have access to Jesus, and yet sometimes find the things that come around and with Jesus bothersome or as a nuisance? Or do you find yourself relating to Jesus, finding yourself on one path, very determined and sure, and for some reason realizing that maybe you should go on another path? out of a prompting of an unexpected person, maybe? Or do you find yourself relating to the woman begging for crumbs because you are so desperate for a miracle, even crumbs we do? Well, let's go through the characters and see what we can learn about God and what God's like, and maybe even a little bit about ourselves. So first, the disciples. I would have to say that many of us probably joined on this call um, could be identified as disciples. Many of us have been uh, Christians for a long time. We're Christ followers. And this line they say in this text, send her away for she keeps crying out after us, I think invites us to something that we Christians need to reckon with. Who have we been sending away? Who keeps crying after us that we choose to ignore or exclude. 
And what we eventually learn in the text, which it takes a little moment to get there, and we'll get to that in a minute, but what we learn is that God's kingdom is bigger than you think. God's kingdom is bigger than we think. God's embrace is larger than you can imagine. Think of someone you think, oh no, not them. I could never go to the same church with them. I could never worship in the same place as them. That person, yes, that person. God is saying, mm, maybe we could sit at the table together with them. I was thinking about this uh, from last week's sermon that Steve preached. We reflected on the text from the beautiful community group content that Pastor Ivy made in our mindfulness community group, Shameless Plug, Tuesdays, 12 p.m. on Zoom. In that text, the Pharisees were asking, why do they eat with tax collectors and sinners? And it made me think of, you know, those finance guys, you know, the bad boys of pharma and the 1% you know, the privileged rich folks. Turns out, yeah, this is Cambridge. There's a lot of them right here. God really challenges me sometimes on this idea of God's expansive love. And I'm not talking about forgive and forget. I'm not talking about not having healthy boundaries. I recently was reading a book called Bold Love by Dan Allender. And one of the five subtitles got me to pick up this book again. How to love an abusive person without opening yourself up to more damage. And it's not just wishy-washy love. It's powerful, it's strong, confident love. They can withstand anything. I experienced some trauma when I was growing up as a child. And there was a time when I was kind of deep in processing this. And I imagined walking into a church one day and having this person who caused me a lot of pain uh, standing there holding the communion plate. I'm not saying you should consider this. It's a complex nuanced journey and uh, unique for everyone, um, each different person. And if this is too soon for whatever particular person you might be thinking of or tender, for you, please feel free to zone me out right now. But what if that our greatest enemies, the worst kind, the ones they say that we say, no, not them. God says, yes, even them. Let me move on to Jesus. Now, this is one of the most interesting texts about Jesus because it's a rare one where Jesus is corrected, disagreed with, and Jesus changes his mind. So what does that tell us about God? Does God change God's mind? Isn't God all powerful and all knowing? Then why didn't God just do in the first place what God was supposed to do? There's extended scholarly debates in the chambers, the academia arguing about this. Did Jesus really know he was God? The divinity of Jesus is a mystery, uh, both and, as common creeds confess, fully human and fully God. Fully human and fully God. That's the beauty of it all, because with all that God is and should and can be and could be, God actually chose to not be with all the things that God could be the body of Jesus to be in relationship with us. If God kept true to all of God's full nature, we would not have access to God. We wouldn't need, God wouldn't need us. We would be robots. And look at Jesus in this text. He's a, a little bit rude. He doesn't even answer her at first. He's like the rabbi that just walks by the guy who was hurt on the side of the road in that Samaritan story. Jesus is kind of being stubborn, saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And then when the woman wouldn't let up, he says to her, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Did Jesus just curse? Did Jesus just call her a dog? 
I recently read a book called On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vuong, a Vietnamese American writer, where the main character is called Little Dog by his grandmother. Because That you and get, you know, despicable dog into. And does God change God's mind? I honest, earnestly believe so. How could it be? Because God isn't worried about the perfect end product. God is actually worried about you. God is worried about what you think, what you have to say. I always get a little bit frustrated with God. Like, why don't you? Fix everything, God. If you're all powerful and all good, why do you let me stumble and fall and bleed? Sometimes God gets quiet when I do these kind of prayers. Quiet and listening and nodding. I would see God quietly putting a hand on my knee where it was bleeding, scraping their hand on the gravel for no reason as if to clean dirt. Sometimes I even see God showing me how to walk and then fall and showing me how to get up. And I would hear God say, because I want to do it with you. Watching my two-year-old girl climb into her car seat by herself is about the most frustrating thing in the world. If I pick her up and sit her down, clip, we're ready to go. But seeing her climbing in the most leisurely fashion, putting her foot down in the most inefficient place to get into the right spot, turned around and struggling. And I'm like, just gripping my hands, trying not to grab her leg into position. Cause actually that's when it starts getting really crazy and it becomes a whole ordeal of I can do it myself. And her leg goes to a different position and she almost gets hurt. So I just have to hold my breath together and let her get in the car seat by herself. And I need to leave the house early so that she can have time to do this. It is completely inefficient. And I have to stand there and just wait. This is my job. I'm sure God is more patient than me, but I also wonder too, like if God is not like, oh, Lydia, can you not just, oh, go, oh, mm. And then again, I let my girl do it all by herself. And then she comes up with the most brilliant, hilarious, <laughs> creative thing ever. Like I would tell her to go on by herself and she'll walk back and she'll grasp my hand and says, what do I want to do with you? And I'm like, this is so humble that I think, yeah, you're right. It's about, you know what prayer is. I think prayers work because it's about doing it with God. Lastly, the woman. Can you relate with her? Jesus um, kind of insults her, but then she doesn't even miss a beat. In fact, this is probably not her first time and she don't got time to get offended because the thing is, she's trying to get her daughter healed. And that is the most important thing. Have you ever been that desperate? Earlier, I talked about the privileged folks welcoming them. The thing is, it just so happens that some people choose not to come themselves. Whether it's community or healing or grace or mercy, sometimes they don't need it that bad. And the reality is many of us have the luxury and the privilege to drown out our uh, real needs with hobbies or food or drinks, preoccupations and projects that numb us to the reality of what we really need. 
Have you ever needed to beg at Jesus' feet for help or mercy? Have you ever been that desperate? When everything you've used as a crutch or a distraction fades away and you are left with not much? When the career you've built or job that you've poured yourself into all of a sudden fires you? When you've given yourself to your children and they grow up and they don't need you anymore? In a way, we get a taste of things like this when we do the spiritual practice, uh, spiritual discipline of fasting. And me, I hate fasting. I used to smoke. Oh, and when I uh, read Michelle Obama's book and heard that Barack smoked, I was like, see, even he did it. But for anyone who's in kind of a uh, sobriety journey, big hats to you because addiction is a dog. I mean, addictions are horrible. And if you can fight that, you, you are really capable of doing anything. Quitting was really hard. During that time, I would walk by someone who's even like just smoking on the side of the street. It took every ounce of me to not ask, hey, can I bum one off you? Instead, I just go, <sighs> crumbs. In a book called Addiction and Grace by Gerald May, he talks about the desire behind addiction. And in his experience, it wasn't just about drugs or alcohol, but he experienced that he worked with with all kinds of addiction, aspirin, work, performing, being liked, helping others, and more. And he talks about his own experience this way compared to what has happened to people who suffer from alcoholism and narcotic addiction. What happened to me may not seem much of a rock bottom but it had the same graceful effect. To state it quite simply, I had tried to run my life on the basis of my own willpower alone. When my supply of successes and this egotistic autonomy ran out, I became depressed. And with the depression, by means of grace, came a chance for spiritual openness. This woman was so desperate that she compelled Jesus to expand his mission and his calling. Because a Canaanite woman's daughter's life mattered. Prayer works. Have you asked God for something with this kind of chance for spiritual openness? Has there ever been a time where you've knelt down and said, help me. Is this you now? And when we do so, God does not turn away. Well, maybe at first, or it might seem as so, but the fact is that God actually changes God's mind for you and expands God's arms fully to embrace whatever state you might be in. And God says to you, you are healed. You are healed. Do we believe that? I don't always believe that. I mostly don't believe it, especially when I'm kind of doing fine and don't need God that much. But for the rest of us, how much do you need help? How much do you need Jesus? Do you need the love of God to break through lesser gods that, that have all failed to satisfy you? Do you need God's healing? even a crumb of it. Dear friends, I hope that you're not in that place where a crumb will do. But if you are, may you taste and see that God is good, that even a crumb will do. 
Let me pray for us. God, will you throw us a bone here? So many of us are holding so much right now, juggling life, school, health, our bodies, our families, our safety. Our bodies are tired of fears and anxieties that we are in need of your peace to break through. Will you shine a light on us, Jesus? And as the psalmist prayed like this too, don't look away. God, answer us. Shine your face on our faces. May you bring healing. May you bring healing in our land, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families, and in our bodies. May you bring healing. Amen. Thank you, Lydia. It's provocative to think of these different textures of prayer and also the continual invitation for spiritual openness. So we're going to move into a time together for this spiritual openness as a community. Many traditions call this the prayers of the people. It's really how we hold one another in awareness of one another, especially through a virtual platform. Um, holding each other's greatest desires and hopes and dreams and longings out for one another to see and to be heard and to be offered to God. So I'm going to invite you in just a moment to place your prayers in the chat. So if you're not super close to your computer, you may want to start making a move closer so you can type into the chat if you want, and um, you can make sure to switch in the chat um, this option of to panelists and attendees if you're comfortable having others see your prayers. We'll take a few minutes of silence and then I'll offer a prayer during which you are invited to respond, God, hear our prayer. In peace, we pray to you, O oh God. For all the people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, God, hear our prayer. And for this community, our neighborhoods and cities and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, God, hear our prayer. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for peace and unity among all who seek to have their being centered in the love. Hi, all. Technical difficulties here, getting reconnected. 
We pray for the kids in pre-K 12 classrooms, their physical wellness and mental wellness. For all kids for their ability to learn and thrive as they're in schools each day. Pray for people who are depressed. Pray for everybody, teachers and students, and so many more navigating uncertainty while learning. For those of us who are just exhausted with struggles that seem unending and unchanging. For families who are going through upheaval, for refugees who have nowhere to go, for moms who are healing from traumas, for moms who are celebrating birthdays in nursing homes, for those who are alone and lonely, we pray God to you for company and connection. God, we pray for all those that are spoken here this morning, these prayers, and for all of those unspoken. God, our hope, who gathers us at tables with all that we hope for and long for and all that we lament, may your blessing and power, we put our trust in you, our living God, risking disappointment and risking failure, but leaning into your love in your presence, nevertheless, expectantly. Amen. I'm going to bring back Lindsay and Matt now for a final song. Hi, everyone. Let's sing one more song together before we close. Um, the word should be on your screen.
take it slowly, seal it for life once again. Thank you, voices of angels. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's so great to be with you and we get to worship still together online. I miss seeing all your faces too, and but still, it's great. your day, your life, and our world now and forevermore. Amen. Go in God's peace. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining.